if you have your Bibles this morning, Exodus chapter 20, we've got a couple weeks left of this chapter. Exodus chapter 20, you can follow along Version Bible app. You can also follow along at lickingag.com, or there's a link on our Facebook page today that'll take you to my sermon notes if you'd like to follow along. We start off with very little scripture, but towards the last half as we apply this, uh, we're going to see a lot of scripture to provide a big picture perspective. And so, you know, I've pastored long enough, and I know you all well enough, that there's going to be two groups of people here today, and both are going to be offended. So, yeah, just get ready. Because I'm going to preach scripture, and we're going to see that we're, generally speaking, we're pretty unbalanced people. We're prone to excess in everything. Where scripture, so I'm going to give it both sides. So, if the majority of people are upset with me today, from both sides, I've probably done my job well. Because as we look at Exodus chapter 20, we're going to be looking at this very simple commandment, and we're going to see how it applies to us in a very real context. And Exodus chapter 20 simply says, do not steal. Thou shalt not steal. If you want to add some King James to it, add a few more words. Don't steal. Don't do it. Now, if we could just bow our heads and pray at this moment, we could be done, right? No, there's more to it than this. Sounds easy enough, but we're going to find out that in Scripture... And in society, we have a really big issue with stealing and theft and all of those categories. And now, I know most of us well enough that here we are, hardworking people, Midwesterners. Are we Midwesterners or Southerners? We're on the border. Kind of depends. Here we are, Midwest, South, what do you want to call us? And most of us can't stand two types of people, thieves and liars. Next week, we're going to deal with the, or two weeks, we'll deal with the lying part of it. We really cannot steal thieves and liars. You can do almost anything else to us. But thieving and lying, we don't have much margin for in our culture. And that's because when someone lies or someone steals from us, we lose something that was ours. And not only do we lose a possession, but when we are lied to or when we are stolen from, we lose confidence, security, possessions, and trust. Has anybody in here ever had something significant stolen from them, like physical property? Don't you feel violated afterwards? Your, your, your privacy is violated. Your possessions are violated. I remember uh, before we moved into our new neighborhood, one of the last things that happened in our old neighborhood was someone went through all the cars, just pilfering through stuff, looking for stuff. But thankfully, I don't have much in my car, and my car wasn't worth being stolen, so they, like, they left me alone. But there's a, there's a moment where you feel like, my stuff was violated. And not just my stuff, but my security, my trust, my confidence. Thievery of whatever kind violates the values of hard work and ownership. And statistically speaking, America has a problem with stealing in its various forms. Here are just a few statistics of theft in our culture, in our country right now. In 2019, the average value of property taken during larceny or thefts was $1,162 per offense. When the average value is applied to the estimated number of larceny thefts, the loss to victims nationally was an estimated $5.9 billion, according to the FBI. In 2017, employees stole or cost their businesses 50 billion dollars through workplace theft that's embezzlement and, and those things not just the pins that we steal accidentally you know talk about embezzlement primarily loss of major equipment those things 50 billion dollars losses from identity theft cases cost 502.5 billion in 2019 and increased 42 percent to $712.4 billion in 2020. I can't comprehend $700 billion. I would like to try. I wonder if you could put, you know, $100 bills, if you could stack it in this room, cubic foot. I don't know, but I'd like to try. The Dodgers payroll. My goodness, the Dodgers. <sighs> no, no, I'm mad. No, I'm just mad. And we have a big issue with theft in the United States. And what is to steal? To steal is to appropriate someone else's property unlawfully. And we have a problem with stealing. 
as a country, even as a community, we have people who regularly engage in stealing and theft. Even in our own community, 95, 97% of people in this town would never steal from you. In fact, they would give you the shirt off their back. But there is a percentage who would steal you blind if possible. If you don't believe me, how many of you lost catalytic converters around here? That's, that's the reason why our bus is inside. Because we've lost a catalytic converter and I don't want to lose another one. Even as a community, theft is definitely out there. We have to be very careful. So it helps us to understand why is theft a sin. What principles does stealing and thievery violate when it comes to God? Well, the theft of sin violates God's principles in at least three different ways. First of all, every theft is a failure to trust in God's provision. I'll let that sit for a minute. Because I don't know that I've ever, heard, have ever had it put quite this way. But larceny, theft, stealing, those things violate one of God's principles in that, first of all, every theft is a failure to trust in God's provision. You see, when we steal, we declare that God has not, will not, or cannot provide for our needs. Think about it. When we steal, we are declaring to God and to whoever else, that God cannot, will not provide for my needs. When we steal, we act in violation of God's word. We violate the principles and promises of God's word. We violate the nature of God. So what if God owns a cattle on a thousand hills? He'll never do anything for me. Oh, I must believe that scripture lied when Jesus said, I shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Apparently, Scripture lied. Therefore, I must take my provision into my own hands, and therefore, I'm going to take what I need. You see, I cannot be fully trusting God if I am actively stealing my way into prosperity. Get it? Catch that. You will not steal your way into prosperity. Can't happen. And so it is helpful for us as believers to ask ourselves, do we truly really trust God. If we do, we will recognize that we do not need to be dishonest. We do not need to lie, cheat, or steal in order to receive what, what God, God knows we need. If we trust God, we will go to God in prayer instead of finding provision elsewhere. Once again, this is one of the reasons why I'm against gambling. Because it places the promise of provision elsewhere other than in God's providence. Been there, done that. If we trust God, we will go to God in prayer with our needs instead of finding provision elsewhere. So every theft is a failure to trust in God's provision. Secondly, every theft is an assault on God's providence for others. When I take from someone else, I am robbing someone of what God has provided for them. And this is going to come up again in Thou Shall Not Covet sermon. Think about this. Theft selfishly declares that God was wrong in giving someone something and not you. Theft takes us outside of God's will, God's plan, and God's blessings by appropriating for ourselves what God has given to someone else. When we steal from others, we are telling that person that they are not worthy of what God has given them. Once again, that and coveting is going to go hand in hand. When we steal from someone, what I'm declaring is saying, you know what? You're not good enough from these things. God was wrong in giving that to you. I'm a much better person to have that item, so I'm going to take that. When we engage in stealing of whatever kind, we are robbing someone of God's providence and provision. Theft violates the command of God upon humanity to steward and cultivate what God has given us. So third, theft, stealing, thievery, they are sins because they dishonor the principles of stewardship. Everybody say stewardship. You are a steward created by God to steward God's things. 
In fact, if you look at the very beginning, when God created Adam, he didn't create Adam to just sit around floating, playing a harp. He did not create Adam just to play a perpetual game of bingo. He created Adam and placed him in the garden so that he could cultivate it, work it, and steward it on God's behalf. So a few things we must remember. Working is not part of the curse. It's the frustration of work that is the curse of sin. We were created to work. We were created to be productive. We were created to be good stewards. We were created to cultivate not only the land, but each other. We were created to do good things. God placed Adam in the garden to steward and cultivate it. And personally, I think it is a shame that Christians have allowed the world to champion the cause of environmental stewardship. You're thinking, what? Is this still out there? Why has environmental stewardship become such a liberal, progressive thing? When it was our responsibility to steward and cultivate the land. Was it not? Was that not our role to play? Well, I know many of us in here, we are big conservationists. We hunt because it's part of our culture, but we also hunt because if there's too many deer out there, they get sick, they run into our cars, and we just can't have that. So also, if you're like me, we deer hunt because it justifies owning the deer rifles that I own. I don't hunt anymore because I need the meat. I hunt because I have to justify to my wife why I take this thing outside once a year. That's why I do it. But stewardship was our job. Conservation was our job. But instead, we have relegated this to a bunch of people that's worshiping the wrong God. And when we've delegated our responsibility to steward this earth that God has given us, what we're doing is we are putting it into the hands of people who do not have a biblical framework, and therefore they cannot approach conservation and stewardship from God's perspective. So instead of the world taking care of something that's a good thing, now all of these people have now created the world into an image of God. Instead of us going out there and taking care of the land and taking care of our fish and taking care of our waters, instead of us doing that and giving thanks to God, we have people out there who are now worshiping Mother Earth. Or whatever. Or whatever. We don't talk about this in the church. You know why? Because we're guilty. Because this was our job. Passed down through Adam, from humanity, we are supposed to take care of our world. Now, how are we going to accomplish that? That's where we get on, on all kinds of stuff. I, I don't know. That's where we get crazy with things. I mean, shoot, Mike bought an electric car. <laughs> oh, he bought it because it's fast, not because he's, yeah. How are we going to accomplish this? I think the answer is just don't be stupid. Just don't be stupid. I don't know what the answer is, but I do know this, is that we have delegated our responsibility and our calling to steward this earth that God has given us, and we've given it to people who do not believe in God, who do not do it as an act of worship. So I just, you know what, I encourage you, how many of you in here have farms? You have a farm place more than like a yard when you take care of that, you're taking care of it on behalf of God. Thank you. When you practice conservation, you're taking care of something that God has given you. When you teach your kids and, you know, they have guinea pigs or chickens or whatever all the, you know, Tadero family has at their house. I don't know. When you encourage those things, you're teaching your people, you're teaching your kids that we were designed to help cultivate and steward and to take care of this environment because God gave it to us. But instead, we've allowed the world to co-opt that message. Some of you are very uncomfortable right now. It was our message first. We have a responsibility to steward well all of our resources. But instead, we keep relegating our responsibility to the world, and they keep messing it up. Even the Apostle Paul encourages us that whatever we do, do it, steward it for the glory of God. Because, here's the principle here, poor stewardship is theft. 
When we are poor stewards, whether it's of God's material, whether it's of ours, whether it's our bosses, when we poorly steward what has been put into our hands, that is theft. Poor stewardship wastes resources that God intended for other things. And we can be poor stewards of all kinds of stuff. We can be poor stewards of our money. That's where we think primarily about it, right? Be poor stewards of money. But you can also be poor stewards of vehicles or of buildings or of property. If you own something, you need to take care of it. Most of us, many of us, are probably poor stewards of our time. We also are poor stewards of talents or even opportunity. But when we poorly steward what God has given us, we are committing theft. When I poorly steward God's resources, I am robbing God. The prophet Malachi said that we rob God when we don't pay tithes. When I poorly steward my finances, I am robbing God. I don't like it, but that's what the scripture When we are bad stewards, we're not operating in the realm of life that God has given us, but we're operating in the realm of theft. And one of the functions of Satan is to steal. When Satan steals from us, one of our reactions, get this, this is probably the deepest part of the message. When Satan steals, because he steals, kills, and destroys, one of our reactions is to blame God for not giving that to us. When Satan comes to your world and he begins to steal stuff from you, whether it's the devourer on your money, or maybe he's stealing all kinds of stuff. He can try to steal your health, he can steal your joy, he can steal your peace, he can work all these things. So often what happens is one of our reactions is we are not mad at the devil, we're mad at God. See, the theft of Satan doesn't only rob us of what God wants for us, it creates frustration and resentment in our lives towards God. Now, think about this for a moment. He is a liar, Satan is, and he is a thief. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. John chapter 10, part A. He's actively engaged in stealing, whatever he can. His reach is large. He's trying to steal whatever he can. And when he comes to your house and he starts trying to steal things from you, our response so often is not, devil, you're making me so mad. So often our response is, why, God? Why? Why are you doing this to me? See what he's doing? He's subverting you. He's turning the attention away from what he's doing, performing a spiritual sleight of hand, and he's causing you to be mad at God. So what is he doing? He's stealing even more stuff. He's stealing faith. He's stealing peace. He's stealing joy. He's stealing confidence. He's stealing security. All of these things that you can only find in God, he's working that and saying, oh, did God really send that your way? Did God really send that to you? Is God really going to answer that prayer? Is God really going to provide in that way? No, I think not. And then he begins to say, I think the proper reaction for you is to be angry at Jesus. If I was you, I'd be mad at God right now. See what he's doing. He's stealing. And it isn't just the fact that you've lost something that belongs to you. It's the fact that now he is trying to turn you away from God and towards him. When Satan steals from us, he purposes for us to be upset at God. For us to blame God for not being good. For us to question God's provision. And for us to question God's faithfulness. And I dare say in a room of this size that some of us are angry at God when we should be angry at sin and at Satan. James 1.17 reminds us that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Satan cannot give you what is ultimately good. So he tries stealing it from you or preventing it from reaching you. So don't be like your father. Don't steal. Don't keep what is not yours. So what's the key thought from this passage? 
I think the key thought of, of the Eighth Commandment is that it validates ownership. You see, if it was wrong to own and possess things, then it would not be wrong to take that away. This is the world we live in today. Are you hearing the narrative that's being played out? Because it's wrong for you to own stuff, it cannot be wrong for me to go ahead and take it. Back in the big riots in Chicago just last year, many of the people were hitting the very luxury stores, diamonds and this and that. And when one of the people was confronted by a news reporter, why are you doing this? The response was, it's okay, they don't need it, and they have insurance. See, when it's wrong to own stuff, therefore it cannot be wrong to take it away. And And some some people are even trying to justify those type of attitudes based upon Scripture, but that's not what Scripture teaches. See, the commandment, do not steal, validates the personal ownership of material things. The commandment, do not steal, validates the personal ownership of material things. So when that new guitar comes in today on FedEx, I am justified by Scripture. Glory! Yeah, I bought a free bedroom mask for a reason. But but catch this. Throughout the Old Testament law, we see that restitution had to be made for what was stolen. Throughout every ancient culture, theft resulted in some sort of punishment. And here's where I'm going to meddle for just a little bit. I think that we must be thankful that we live in a country that allows and permits the opportunity for material prosperity. When our founding fathers established the country on the rights of three things, originally it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of land. Later on, we changed that to the pursuit of happiness. They helped create a system that allowed for the accumulation of wealth. Much of the world, my friends, and most of our fellow brothers and sisters living outside of the United States live in places where ownership is not possible and is not permitted. If you've ever met someone who has lived overseas, from people who maybe have immigrated here or you met them while you were there, we realize that dreams of land ownership or vehicle ownership or even how we get to spend our time, or how many children we can have, are decisions that many people across the world do not get to make for themselves. Just recently, just this week, or just the last few weeks, Communist China has finally declared that couples can now have three children, up from the two, and which is up from the one that was just a few decades ago. Just this week, now I don't know that this is a bad idea, but... This week, China announced that minors under 18 are not allowed to play video games during the week. And then it's like one hour a day on the weekends. Now, as adults, we're like, no, that's, that's overreaching. As parents, I've just given you the best ammunition you can have all the rest of the year. It is cited in my notes with the web report. This is real information. Now, you know, used to growing up, it was like, you better eat all your food because there's starving kids in Africa. Now it's going to be like, you're complaining about an hour of time? Well, there's kids in China who don't get to use it all week long. You are welcome. You are welcome. Feel free to tip me if that helps you at all. Here in America, where we get to really do, at least for now, whatever we want to do, and however we want to do it, these are rights and freedoms that most of the world has never had. And as you know, I'm a person of history, and I believe that Americans would do well to examine history along with current events so that we can appreciate where we live and the freedoms we presently have. And although I admit that wealth brings all sorts of problems, and even though it seems that the rich keep getting richer, I am thankful to live in a country that, per- that permits the opportunity to be blessed. And at the very least, I am thankful every time I can turn on my water faucet and have very cheap, affordable, clean water. We all have phones that connect us all over the world. It may not be the newest thing. It may not be the best thing, but it's ours. And it leaves us connected. Church, we must be thankful for what we have 
lest we take it for granted and lose it. Even within the church, we must guard against theologies that espouse communism and socialism as biblical ideals and people who preach against private ownership. Because the Eighth Commandment argues against the belief that communism and socialism are the biblical ideal. Why am I talking about this? Because it's an issue. Not so much in here, but it's an issue. And people are wrapping spiritual language around this, wrapping it around this. You can't use scripture to say, you know what, it's, it's God's will for you to be communist. No. No. You ever met a communist? They don't want to be communist. So there's the biblical underpinning for theology. It is okay for us to work hard and to own things. It is okay for that to happen. That is okay. All right? You don't have to apologize for owning stuff. I may have to apologize to my wife for buying a guitar, but I don't have to apologize to you. That's different. You may... You may have to apologize to your spouse about buying something, Tommy Grace, but you don't have to apologize to me about it. (laughs) Scripture. Scripture permits the ownership of stuff. Now, if I stopped there, everybody would like me, but I can't. Okay. So let's talk about the the other excess. Because we have a movement. Not saying, no, socialist, that's, that's what God wants us to be. Jesus was a socialist, we should be too. No. But we have that side. Then we also run into the other gamut that says that my wealth is the primary indicator of my spiritual success. But when we read all of the Bible, we see that Scripture supports both having and not having. Abraham was very rich, and God had no problems using him as the father of both Judaism and Christianity. But then Jesus in Matthew 8, 18 through 20, says, When Jesus saw a large crowd around him, he gave the order to go to the other side. And a scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. In Acts, Bartimaeus had enough stuff to be able to sell property in order to give generously to believers. Lydia, in the book of Acts, was a very wealthy businesswoman a dealer in purple cloth, and she used her wealth to support Paul's ministry. And then you have Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler who were both required to lay down material possessions in order to take their next steps with Jesus. So as we look at the full scope of Scripture, wealth or its absence cannot be used as an indicator of our spiritual value, progression, or identity. See, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates are the wealthiest men in the world, and they are certainly not followers of Jesus. I know just a few years ago, I personally stood with the Roma people, the gypsies in Slovakia, who owned nearly nothing, and yet that night they worshiped Jesus with a passion that puts us to shame. If you've been watching the news, we are hearing reports from Afghanistan and other brothers and sisters throughout the world who remind us that the church is still persecuted and under attack. And so once again, I remind us that we should be thankful for being born in the United States of America. And we need to stop being ashamed of being born in America and give thanks instead. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. And we may not like our present direction. Is there much to be concerned about? Absolutely. But we should still be thankful, church. I personally have some missionary friends who are missionaries from another country, and they now live in the United States. And one of the most happiest days of their lives, other than being married and being saved, was the days that they became American citizens. I remember riding in a transit from from John Wayne International Airport, Santa Ana, California. Is that where it was? Anyway, Los Angeles area. Going to LA or going to Anaheim. I remember riding and you're, we're having conversations with our driver. And they're telling us how he came to the United States and he has his, uh, his um, American 
uh, citizenship scheduled for just a few weeks ahead. And I remember thinking to myself that this man had been studying and working and do everything to receive that which I was given the day I was born. And so instead of me saying, oh, I can't believe you, we applauded. And in that transit with a bunch of men, we had tears in our eyes because we knew that this man was pursuing something that was good. Church, we've got to stop apologizing. We've got to make sure that we have our heads on straight and that we're thinking clearly. Is our country perfect? No, but I have been to other countries, and this is the best country in the world. We have opportunities in front of us if we will receive them to do all kinds of things, and that's not a bad thing, church. And still yet, I must remind us that we cannot allow physical wealth and prosperity to be our primary indicator of spiritual success. And I know, because I pastored this church for 11 years, I know that we have people on both sides. We have people who espouse poverty as the extreme spiritual virtue. Oh, believe me, we have them. The poorer I am, the closer I am to Jesus. That idea has been around for a long time. So it also has the opposite idea. The richer I am, the closer I am to Jesus. But both extremes miss the point. You see, money and wealth are neutral. It's how you use them. It's the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not money. It's not money. I mean, I'm hoping some of you put some money in the offering plate before we leave today. You know? Money's neutral. Wealth is neutral. It's not the primary spiritual indicator that I'm doing great spiritually. But just because you're broke doesn't mean you're doing great spiritually either. Okay? Because we have both sides going here. Let me give you a biblical example of someone who walked this very well. Outside of Jesus, the Apostle Paul is probably the most important person of faith in the New Testament. And if you will study Paul's background just a little bit, he grew up probably wealthier middle class. His parents were tradespeople and they were merchants. They were Roman citizens, which was a big bonus. We see that his parents could afford to allow Paul the best religious education possible in that day. And before Paul was saved, he could boast of the best things, the best family, the best lineage, the right family, and the right education. Unlike Peter, James, and John, who were considered unlearned and unimportant men, Paul had it all working for him. But when the Apostle Paul met Jesus, what he valued the most changed. Because of Jesus, the Apostle Paul was able to find contentment through every situation and circumstance. To demonstrate that, allow me to use three witnesses from Scripture that shows how Paul was able to be content irregardless of his circumstances. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 through 30. Paul writes, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. I've experienced toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing, not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me and my concern for all the churches. But who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If boasting is necessary, I will boast about, about my weaknesses. weaknesses. Philippians chapter 4, 11 through 13. Paul writes, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 1 Timothy 6, 6-11. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. 
So if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from these things, and instead pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So you summarize those three, and I had to pull back from many, many more examples. We find that Paul experienced it all. He's had the highs and he's had the lows. And yet he found genuine, spirit-filled contentment regardless of his present condition. And that leads us to this truth. If you refuse to serve God when times are hard or when money is tight or when life isn't going your way, then you are not a true follower of Jesus. Jesus' words say, pick up your cross and follow me. Whatever your cross may be, whatever it may entail, you must pick it up. And then again, the flip side, church, don't justify your poverty with spirituality. Just as riches are not the absolute signs of God's favor, neither is poverty. I've known rich people who are not going to heaven, and I know poor people who are not going to heaven. But we must come to this point, that my life does not have a dollar sign attached to it. It has a cross attached. Jesus did not redeem me with money, although he owns the vast riches of it all. Instead, he redeemed me with the blood of Jesus. His death upon the cross redeemed me. Many of us, most of us in here know what it means to have nothing. We also know what it means to have something. But here's the reality. If I don't have Jesus, nothing else matters. Without Jesus, nothing matters. So how can we pray over this message today? As Jenny comes to the piano for just a moment or two this morning. I want to ask this question once again. If you do not know Jesus, if you don't love Jesus, if you don't live for Jesus, the reality is nothing else will matter to you. But if you want to change all that, Scripture says that by confessing our sins and believing in Jesus, that we can experience salvation and forgiveness. So if there's anyone here today, here in just a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity I'm going to give you the opportunity to say, Pastor, I need to get things right with God. Maybe today you find yourself that life is out of balance. Maybe you've placed too much hope and trust in things that are not God. Perhaps you've allowed the good things to become bad things by worshiping them instead of the provider. And so may our prayers this morning echo the words of the Apostle Paul. May we give thanks regardless of the season that we are living in. So this morning is a great time for us to examine our hearts and put things in perspective. Jesus, you are my all in all. As the song said this morning, I had another conversation about it. Someday we will all throw our crowns down at the feet of Jesus. Because outside of Jesus, Nothing else matters. We're going to pray for those two things, and then here at the end, we're going to pray for our country. That we'll continue to experience the freedom that the message of Jesus may continue to go out to all the world so that they might hear the gospel. So would you bow your heads and your hearts with me this morning very quick? If you would be here today and you're saying, Pastor Paul, I do not have a relationship with Jesus, but I want that to change today. Would you be so bold and raise your hand so I know who to pray for this morning? I'm going to give you just a moment. There's a couple hands going up right now. Who else this morning? You don't know Jesus, but you want to. Who else today? A few more going up. Who else today? Thank you for those hands. I just want to take a moment. I want to just pray over you. You don't have to come up. Please see me after service. I want to give you a Bible. I want to connect with you. I want to pray over them. Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, for these who raised their hands this morning. 
as you see their heart. Lord God, I pray right now that you will lead them into a relationship with you. Lord, we confess, we admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But thank you for forgiving us and changing us and helping us to be the women and the men of God you created us to be. So help us to walk, oh God, in the fullness of your love and of your spirit. So Lord, save us. Change us, oh Lord. Help us to live our life for you. In Jesus' name. Maybe this morning you find yourself in a place where life is just kind of out of balance. Life is just out of balance. Your love for Jesus is not as strong as it should be. Your Bible reading, your prayer time, your worship, they're being, they're being stolen. So right now, this morning, if that is you, right where you're at, would you just take a moment? I want to pray for you and pray over you that the Lord will increase your appetite for the things of his kingdom, that all of us will desire to draw closer to Jesus than we've ever had before. So let me just pray that over you this morning. God, I pray today. I pray, God, for all of us that we might draw closer to you, that we will live that life of abundance that you talked about, and that what the enemy has been stealing from us, Lord God, that not only will the stealing stop, but you will restore what has been taken. So God, I pray right now that you increase our hunger and our capacity for the things of your kingdom. May we love you more. May we want to pursue you more through prayer and through Bible reading, through worship. God, would you have your way in our hearts and our minds, oh Lord God, that we might be the women and the men of God you've created us and you've called us to be. So Lord, have your way. Help us, oh God. Help us, Lord God, to pursue you pursue you. For your word tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And then all these other things will be added. So may you be our priority. May you be our goal. May you be the one we desire with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our souls. So God, we worship and adore you. In Jesus' name. Is there anybody here this morning, you're like, Pastor, would you pray for me? I need healing today. Jenny, you can keep playing for a little bit longer. Anybody here this morning? Is there somebody? Anybody else? Pastor, I need, I need healing today. I need Jesus to heal something. A few more hands. A few more hands. Well, we can do this one of two ways. We can have you come to the front and pray, or I can pray for you from here. Anybody want to come front? Super quick. I won't pray for you all. I saw you who raised your hands. So God, I pray right now, Lord. For the ladies who raised their hands, the three or four of them who raised their hands right now, I pray, God, for your healing power and virtue to come upon them. Lord, do you see exactly what each one is going through, what they have dealt with? Lord, God, do you see the anxiety that is attached to this, uh, to this problem, to this, to this issue? So, God, I pray right now for healing physically, spiritually, and emotionally, that what has been will not be going forward. May God, that you will cause quick recovery and amazing grace to come upon these women. So, Lord God, I pray for divine healing for them. For, Lord God, for you to strengthen, for you to restore, for you to redeem. So, God, I pray right now by the power of your blood, because of your love and your provision for us, we receive your divine healing today in this place. For you are our healer and you are our provider. You are the one that we love and that we adore. And we give you thanks for the healing that is taking place in the lives of these and bodies of these women right now. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said.